So the new album is called Pure. The idea, the concept is it's all about the purity and the innocence that we have when we're very young and it's also about the, uh, how we lose that as we get older and then as we come into adulthood the difficulties that we face and the insecurities that we face um, as we go just about to go through one of the most major parts of our lives. Um, the first song on the album is called Indigo um, and it's all about the aura around us which apparently when we're very young is indigo colour and uh, I had this idea that uh, when kids um, are born they have this aura which is very blue and as they get older apparently they lose it and uh, one of our road crew told me that there's a book called The Indigo Children uh, which is a story about exactly that which kind of shored up my uh, concept in the first I've been trapped for most of my this life is new, some of this. in so, this airtight box if I could get just one arm free Max found the lyric book right? then the world the original would notice me there was a swear word in it and he, he, he was shocked <laughs> Not sure if I could get the book. just one arm Yeah, so uh, the songs on Pure, um, uh, it's going to be a great album. It's going to have probably the rawest edge of any Head Dragon album today. The guitar sounds that Nick has got are fantastic. <laughs> He's mic'd a lot of cabs up the, the old traditional way to get some really big fat guitar sounds. Spent a lot of time on that. Um, so, um, with Scott's drumming as well, which is Scott's very much a powerful drummer. Um, so, it's yeah, it's, it's going to be a really powerful sound. So, in Indigo, um, you've got um, the lyric that goes, I've been trapped inside this air uh, for most of my life inside this airtight box. I think a lot of people can relate to that and how that feels. Um, you know, which is the cover, the contortionist, um, the youth who's contorted in, it just looks very disturbing and uh, that's sort of how youth is. It feels like that I think very many uh, times, you know, to the problems that we have with parents and authorities, schools, you know, doing things that we don't want to do and, you know, it's very strange because we hear our parents talk about uh, things that are for our own good and then we find that we're doing that you know with that saying the same things to our children as well it's very it's a very difficult period of time and I think pure covers that spectrum of the difficulties of adolescence um, for the beginning of indigo um, I wanted quite a wide guitar sound so we recorded four guitars which you got here we've got um, two strats and um, because that sound is a bit light on the bottom, we put in a couple of Gibson Les Pauls as well, just to give it a lot more weight underneath. So these two. That's the fender strap. And again, a bit of weight. Underneath that you've got the Gibson Les Paul there which has got a lot more bottom end to it which uh, I mean that was plugged in directly into the Fender Twin Reverb uh, with no effects just guitar going straight in uh, no distortion or anything just the amp really <laughs>
Um, as with Believe, with Pure as well, I've um, really, really got into samples. I love them. I think they're, they're great. They just really add so much character to the sound of the song. I've always wanted samples and thought, how can I get those kinds of sounds? You know, I love those. I hear them on TV adverts and always wanted to use them. And I, they're just are so effective. Um, that you just end up going mad, you just put samples over everything and suddenly the song just takes on a whole new life of its, of its own. I mean on the beginning here I've got dogs barking, here we go, dogs. There's your dogs. And what have got here? Check this out, I think this is just... That's um, a whole choir going, ah. But it's been detuned, so it sounds kind of a little bit disturbing. It's a weird sound. Oh, we got to the end of this one. See this one. Yeah, pretty chilling. Great stuff. What's this one? This is the same kind of thing. Choir doing some weird stuff. They're just repeating a phrase, but right at the background, it can be very, very effective. But then to take it in a completely different direction, you know, we've got um, here um, some app from, um, I think it's World of Voices, the sample disc is called. I shouldn't be telling you this because you nick them. <laughs> but um, there's some sounds here which... Zulus in the background. And here's more, these are Zulu kids. I love these, these are great. Brilliant. Two of them voices here. Check it. Once you chuck all these into the pot, if you've actually got a very strong basic song um, and you start throwing these things in, you know, it, it's just like a kid in a sweet shop. It's so unbelievably exciting. Uh, working on the new album, uh, at this stage in the proceedings, is always a bit of a, a, a sort of a vague experience. I mean, I know this from the other bands that I work with. When you're kind of in charge of the whole project like Nick is, then he can see the big picture, whereas from my point of view, I've seen, you know, little bits and pieces. We've sat down and worked on keyboard parts and there's a kind of a, a sample noise here, a little running part there. So I don't really know the whole songs yet. I'm just hearing sort of sections and I walk down into the studio and I kind of, I'm starting to hear the vocals and suddenly that sample's starting to make sense. So, yeah, I, you know, for me it's a kind of a bit of a voyage of discovery as well. So I, I tend to kind of stay a little bit away from it now until the, you know, Carl's pretty much got the mixes running so that I can actually hear them pretty much as, as a fan will hear the album when, when they get it. I wanted the last part of Indigo to have uh, a dreamlike quality, um, slightly oppressive, um, I mean, the music has got uh, a, quite a jazzy sort of feel to it um, and quite floaty sort of summery feel to it with the guitar and everything. It's a lovely string sound in there as well and the lyric is quite oppressive because it's about getting up on a Monday morning when you look out the window and it's grey skies and it just feels horrible and the, the world seems such a hideous place. And then, you know, as our character's going through these thoughts, at the end of it, um, you know, I will dive into a deep blue lagoon and swim away from here. That's your antidote. Or oh, right there, all of a sudden, it's put right. So, uh, you know, hopefully it's got a kind of a bright ending as well. A little bit of dust. Keyboards on Pure, uh, what I wanted to do was really kind of take an approach which was um, having the keyboard melodies played in a way that was probably quite classic progressive rock, but the sounds were, that's what took it into another dimension. So to make it, I mean, for example, in Indigo, um, we've used a trance sound with a simple kind of riff that goes. <laughs> And 
And there's a filter on that which kind of opens up very slowly and then closes. Um, it's touch sensitive so it depends how, you, how hard you play it. It's a sort of a trance feel to it and it sounds like this in the actual track. On the day we'll put a bit of delay or a bit of reverb on it and make it sound really enormous. That will really come thundering out. It's a different kind of sound um, you normally hear in this kind of music even though the musical notes and the approach um, will be kind of familiar. Do you know what? My name is Michael Kane. Michael Caine. Do you know what? My name is Michael Caine. Giving away a Michael Caine DVD. Mm -hmm. And all I wanted was a That's just a waste of food. Another side of the Pure album is all about, um, it occurred to me, um, how people grow up through their lives, how some people have a completely easy ride, they don't seem to have any uh, financial problems or major traumas, and they just waltz through life, and yet other people just have, their, their lives are just riddled with problems constantly. Um, and I just found this kind of an interesting concept to you know, consider this and how uh, quite often the people with the traumas and what have you actually grew up far happier um, you know, because it showed them disappointment and therefore the kind of value of things in life. The second track on the album is called A Razorhead um, which is loosely based on the idea of David Lynch's film um, the song is all about, uh, I read a book called The Whisperers, which is all about uh, communist Russia from the 20s all the way through to 1990. And um, I felt that there was a concept there, this kind of aiming for ideology, that we've sort of got now here in the West via things like political correctness and um, the, the whole kind of green issue. And... I think this way of thinking has educated a lot of very young people who, you know, perhaps were born in the uh, 60s and seven, perhaps the late 60s and 70s um, in a very liberal uh, society and they seem to have been brought up with almost a parallel of communism but it's political correctness. And I believe that this is extremely dangerous in our society. Um, and the relation with a razor head here is that the, uh, it's a very surreal horror film, if you don't know the film. It's a very strange black and white film that's uh, it's just very uncomfortable all the way through. Very David Lynch. And uh, the, the parents bringing up this child, basically the child is a mutant and they try to pretend that it sort of isn't and that everything's going okay. So that's the kind of parallel with my uh, concept of a razor head. Mask for Christmas. Hey? I want a Dalek mask for Christmas. They oh, say they're just looking at really? the, uh, 
with only 160 yeah. days left to go till Christmas, shall be nice. Maybe so that's what it is, really, that's a good yeah. way. Yeah. There's really been every right. album Thanks. released and toured by that. You can get yourself a Dalek voice-changing helmet. Well, maybe um, that's the way to go, so it's slip. We could wear those as protective things now. There's some, it's called broken as far. Colin. I think you can find <laughs> there it is! There it is! Suck it! You just so won't let it go, will you? See, that's the thing, it's like I said before, you just think, you think Carl Grove, what a nice guy, but not go. really, not really. <laughs> he's subtle, but he's dangerous as uh, anything. Oh, yeah, but you see. He said that, see, he lined it all up. He's got Clive there, he's got me here, he's come out with a wolf's head, and he's on camera. And yeah, he knows, there it is! He knows he's treading thin ice, quite literally, yeah, right, because know, yeah. there's plenty of information I've known over he's the got, years. He's got pictures of me as well. I don't think we want to start discussing the Piero dolls quite yet, no, do no, we? Ow! No. Ow! Ow. <laughs> Keep the camera running, guys. <laughs> Keep the camera running. Oh, this is this the is stuff good, they This want. is good material. Good this is what they think the fans want to hear about. The band's early days of dressing up. Yeah, nice. And what did you dress Come up in? Circle. What did you dress up in then, Carl? What was your band image? What's the, what's the Pierrot's thing? Well, I, I, well that I, might be another kind of band. It wasn't I, I think yeah. we need to leave it there before this gets messy. It's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur, let's face it. I think <laughs> if we look back over the Pendragon years, I, I suspect a couple One of prison uniforms things. might come to the fore. What uniforms? Oh, oh yes. Do you remember the prison uniform with the arrows? Oh, well, perhaps I should take my PA to a band where I might be appreciated a little more. Oh, I didn't know that one. I, I, I think my, my favourite one, That's although this bad. wasn't entirely your fault, and I always remember Peter admitting oh, to no. it, was you had this great idea to come up with some cardboard mountains for Alaska oh, no. or something. Oh, really? <laughs> so they're going to get some cut out. But I think it went a bit spinal tap, didn't it? It just couldn't get big enough Kellogg's cornflakes packets. So, yeah, that wasn't going to work, was it? <laughs> uh, for a razor head, it starts off in a 7 8 time signature, which. All progressive rock people know it's the best time signature for keyboard riffs and keyboard solos. Um, I was looking, I had a riff on a melody, um, but I didn't want to use the bog standard Mini Moog lead sound. I wanted to use something which was um, more aggressive, more kind of like your Tony Banks with a chainsaw and a gimp mask. And I found this sound, which I think is great. <laughs> got filters that open up as well, it just sounds so chunky. Yeah, it's really in your face, which I've been looking for these kinds of sounds for ages, and it's great that I've got this, this, uh, this is from a Korg Triton, this sound. Absolutely love that one. And the end result is... With Pendragon, I mean, it's because it's been such a long time we've been together. Uh, I mean, a lot has happened, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm sure if I sat down and, you know, planned to write a book, we could fill it very easily. And we've had many exciting little achievements on the way through. We've had a few very exciting disasters as well. But uh, I mean, the Lorelei Festival last year was, I, I thought, was very exciting. We went on stage, we had no idea what to expect and the reaction was really great. So the things I tend to remember are those. But I also remember my very first concert with Pendragon and um, it was in Gravesend, somewhere around London. And we drove to it in a box Luton and myself and Nick and Peter got to sit on the shelf and it was one of those boiling hot days <clears throat> and so there was a smell of diesel and the sun was coming through, I mean, couldn't be much more uncomfortable. And uh, we, we set up in the venue and this was like the first concert so my head was full of all this material I was trying to remember. And in the middle of the concert, uh, there was a bit of a sort of a, you know, sort of a half-hearted audience and in the middle of the concert something went wrong one of the keyboards broke down as they were tended to do in those days and I just remember trying to get the attention of the sound engineer Chris 
and I just remember all I could see was a sea of Budweiser flags and it was just again just stuck in my memory I can still see them now these Budweiser flags somehow representing the situation at the time and then uh, we didn't even have a dressing room so we kind of got into the back of the van it was like opened up the van and we all got into the van after the concert and, the, and then the shutter at the back of the van just closed on its own and we were just left in total darkness and there was just a sigh and then these four lighters went Ch -ch -ch. with cigarettes, it was like that sort of, I can't remember what it was, a Hamlet moment. <laughs> and that was really my kind of basis for a razor head. Um, I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to suddenly where the guitars just leapt at you and they were kind of gritty and grindy and it had all the kind of elements of uh, the energy of punk but the melody of, um, you know, Pendragon. So, you know, all these sounds here are quite brash chord sounds. thing called an angle which I borrowed from Carl Groom um, which I set up here for a little while it was all right I did this lead sound it's quite nice actually for that part but I kind of struggle with it to get any other kinds of sounds so I only used it for this song it's a nice bit on this song Also a little bit of delay, some of the sounds that I want to record um, with effects on because you can't recreate some of those effects in the, uh, later on in the mix, it's just a pain in the neck, you know, put effects on everything. One sound that I've used an awful lot on this album with a Fender Twin Reverb was um, a, the tremolo effect, you know, which I also used in the pod as well. Um, everyone's using it at the moment. Everybody's using it. It's uh, it's just a great sound that's sort of come back from the uh, the, the, the sort of late fifties, I think, early sixties, and uh, it's just gone full circle. It just sounds. It, it's just vibrated its way back into usage again now. It's a great sound. It's just great to sort of put behind a couple of other guitars because it just gives it life. Like in this context, this is the chorus of a razor. Another one of my favourite samples on a razor head was um, this. Uh, it's called Manic Guru. It's just incredible. It's, the atmosphere is just fantastic. This is it. Here. Quite loud in the mix so you can get a sense of what it's like. Ain't that something? You can just imagine some Aborigine sat on the top of 
airs rock, shouting that out into the middle of the night. It's just, just got so much power. That's what I like about with samples. It's like you know when people uh, you went to Papua New Guinea when we first went there as explorers, and we took photographs. They believed that you were stealing their soul with the, in the in, in the photograph. In the camera, it's a little bit like that with samples. I think you get a part of a person's soul almost in that. When you put it in your music, it just kind of like comes alive like that. I love that sample. We played in Reichen back in Germany with this huge bridge, and Michael Becker said that this is a very popular bridge for jumping off people to jump off. So we, he, a lot of people commit suicide at this bridge. So we did the gig and everything, went home. And then a couple of weeks later we were playing in Lorelei, which is a gorge. Mm -hmm. And you can look over the edge and it's hundreds of feet down dashing rocks. And Michael Baker just said, yeah, So we will see you in Lorelei again next weekend where there will be another opportunity <laughs> to jump. <laughs> so if Frank Baker can get you, Lorelei will. <laughs> sing anything then I wasn't recording so serious trouble at school um, from being bullied and it completely switched how uh, I, I felt about people and um, I, no, I no longer trusted people and that kind of feeling stayed with me. Uh, so it takes a long time to get my trust even now um, but the anger I think then I, I kind of pushed it away and I think the difficulty with at that point trying to become a musician as well, the frustration, all those sort of negative feelings have uh, really sort of come out in pure um, because they are how I was when I was a, a youth. And uh, it's quite strange that they come out now. I mean, this is the great thing about an album that has emotions that are very real because the record is very real. You know, it's not some, what should we write about now? Let's write about something which no one can tell what it is. You know, it's just so often the case with this sort of music. <laughs> None of the songs, and it really annoys me, you get songs that are not about things, they're just kind of, they're just there. You'd never fathom out in a million years what they're all about. But I like songs that are about things that people can kind of relate to. And um, in this period of my life, I think it's coming out in pure. But in a way, it was that. I mean, I always think that something negative, and this is very important, I think, that something negative, you can get something very, you can use that negativity, um, you know, which I always have done, tried to at least, through that negativity about uh, being bullied at school, it made me um, very resilient in the future to um, what people said or thought about me because I didn't care anymore you know I was very focused on where I was and if people criticized me I didn't like it but it didn't put me off so I would always bounce back um, you need those things in life sometimes those negative th 
things to actually get something positive. Um, you know, the problems I had at school and the wish to be a musician, the difficulties that I had, those are the things that gave me the drive, and which I've still got now. I still have um, a great deal of drive for what I do. If I can see that it can be made to happen, I will move heaven and earth to try and make it happen. No, I kind of like it. It's dangerous. You hate your friends, but you always take them back. No. No. <laughs> the second part of the song is called Space Cadet, and it's all about the folly of youth. And it's a happy song, it's very bouncy, and it's the greater aspect of being youthful, the forgetfulness, the lack of responsibility, the slight selfishness that's in there, but there's kind of a happiness that goes with that too. Um, the irony in this is that it is then very quickly juxtaposed by a very chilling uh, part of the song. So... Um, the second part of Space Cadet is uh, about somebody who starts to think about how insecure they feel and how isolated they feel from everybody at the school and it's sort of a reflection of some of the things that have happened in the last few years where kids have thought like this and they felt so bad about it that they've ended up taking in a gun and shooting people in the school. Um, and it's a very chilling kind of aspect and it has a very chilling feel in the song. Um, I think people will really pick up on that because the kind of voice that I'm using in it is slightly crazed and slightly mad. So look at those little babies. Scott's little babies. Bless. It's Yeah. All right. You always hear that when you have babies. You're just making a rob for your own back. And the next? Just call it baby at the place. <laughs> okay, cue the music. It's all happened. It's all gone. You're getting this, Wills. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Careful. Electrocuted. Give him a belt. <laughs> The third part of Comatose is, um, it's again it's sort of a story, but it's true to life as well. Um, it's somebody who gets involved in a cult um, and how they're uh, influenced by the cult leader and then one day they wake up and realise that it's absolute load of rubbish that they're hearing. Um, I think, you know, when you're young and you're going through all that kind of search that you go through, that's something that's very, very easy to get involved in, with because you're looking for answers and you're looking for things and um, I think a lot of young kids can end up going that way. So the song is about this kid who's joined a cult and he suddenly sees it for what it is and then uh, the whole thing goes full circle because he actually comes back home as well. The last part of the song is called Home and Dry, um, you know, which brings us kind of back to the beginning, but he's had all these experiences of going through life. Uh, we're actually on our way down, we're on our way down to Clive's. i uh, do a bit of um, mixing. I just thought we'd stop here because, can you get that? Yeah. Titmus Park here. That is the home of the former Beatle, John Lennon. It's his place. And that is where um, that big white room with the big white piano and Imagine was filmed. Imagine. Huge place that. Massivo. I think there's a couple of bits of footage where you see him and Yoko wandering around in the garden as well. That's there, Titmus Park. 
I used to go past this almost every day when I go past Clive's house, to Clive's house. We did some rehearsing or mixing. You know, Lennon's place was in the middle. I think that says quite a lot about us. There's me and Ascot, there's Clive and Virginia Water, and Lennon in the middle. Lennon. You know, because I mean, it wasn't so sorted out as Paul, you know, do you know what I mean? I mean, Paul was more, more looking tired, all minutes rolling in for. I think Paul as well, you know, with Linda, was more sorted out, you know. John was just funny. John was just John. John was John. I'm talking like I know them. <laughs> well, I do. The spirit of Lennon has visited me and said, here, mate, don't do prog. <laughs> yeah, and Elvis, he said it. But I didn't listen. And, and Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrix. That's so bad news. Bad news. Bad news. For you and you and you and you. I mean, Paul, you know, I've got to go. Traffic lights turn. Beat on the end of that last one. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, just one crash, just to finish it off. So that wasn't bad. Just yeah. really constant. You got it at the beginning, but you got weak because you went on that. Microphone anyway. That might be part of the problem. It's coming. That's a horror bit of trouble. What he's doing is he's doing one bass drum, one tom. And then he's hitting two toms with one stroke like that. So he's going da ba da 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 ba da 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 ba da 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 Stop talking about it. In your commentary. He'll make us pay for that now. Yes, that'll be, be a bit of all the claws. On Comatose, um, I wanted to write something which was started out life on the piano and something with a very melancholic melody. Uh, we haven't written anything on piano for quite some time. I mean, there's stuff like Total Recall and The Shadow, you know, which are very piano based. Um, and I love the sound of it. If you can get a good piano sound, a good feel with the piano, it just creates such a great atmosphere. And I wanted to start the song off with something very melancholic, um, so this was the right kind of idea, and so I wrote this part. great way of starting off a song because um, it's so different from um, you know Razor Head and Indigo so it starts with a very different slant. Beautiful, very melancholic. What we're trying to do now is uh, doing the end of Space Cadet, we're looking for something slightly different. It's kind of like a trancey hypnotic sort of feel to the end of it and I want something like 
kind of a 60s sort of feeling. Something a little bit kind of doorsy, it's a little bit kind of hypnotic, a little bit kind of big fat ride cymbals and really kind of open drums that sound... Um, usually they actually sound really, really crummy, but they have a certain atmosphere about this kind of sound that sounds really good. It's just kind of like two mics almost, micing up a drum kit, not, not particularly overproduced, but it has a real character about it. It's like some two inch thick ride cymbals that sound like you know, really 30 foot wide, huge, huge, deep sounding ride cymbals and toms that sound, you know, really sort of open and we're trying to capture that sort of thing so Carl's just put a few more mics up to get a more kind of ambient sound. So, Narm, Narm, you've got to imagine like, um, it's not really supposed to be this, you know, it's not supposed to be this kind of thing. It's like slightly kind of dope induced. There's an image that goes with this sort of Vietnam doors ish kind of trancey stoned feeling. That's fine, yeah. Yeah, great big brown ride symbols. <laughs> Lovely. I'll tell you what you can chuck in as well, Scott, might be quite good. A little bit of the old mark tree. We like some of that. Yeah? That's a little bit Vietnam, Viet Cong. So what are we coming there? Right, go on. <laughs> I've used the Les Paul going through the Boss GT5 um, sat on top of quite a big brown cat and then that is rooted it's quite important to have a big brown cat otherwise you can't see what you're doing it's quite important to have the big brown the big brown cat underneath the pedal board the extra the extra tip over the cliff um, and that's going through a purple Fender Twin Reverb again it's got to be purple um, it's an old one. It's an old 70s Fender Twin Reverb. It's a classic camp. It looks a bit weird. <laughs> it looks like a bit, a little bit like an old radio set you might find at your grandparents. But yeah, it's a classic camp with a great sound. There's a sound on here called Fantasy. Um, I wanted to try and use some very drastically different sounds. I haven't used this one before. I used this in um, uh, the first part of Comatose. Uh, Use the strap on that one actually recorded it. It's a really lovely sound. Boy, that's heavy. Um, again, on the kind of real heavy stuff where I really want to get. Um, a big power chord sound. Uh, a lot of the rock on this album is not your kind of classic rock. Um, I got into a lot of the sounds of new metal um, a few years ago 
Um, you know, when we're doing Believe, that was my first kind of entry into this kind of music, and I really liked it. I really liked the kind of the youthfulness of this, rather than sort of real crusty old classic hair rock, as I got a rock that goes up to eleven, where everything's kind of everything's full on all the time. It, it's not um, a youthful sound; it's kind of an old sound that now I think. Um, you know, which will probably come back round in about twenty years' time. But this kind of new metal, um, you know, with detuned guitars, and that's what I did on here. Most of that is the Les Paul again going through the GT5, going through the Fender Twin Reverb. Got two channels of that, plus also I think we've got a couple of tracks of um, the pod as well. To, and it's detuned down as well, which gives it a really heavy sound. That's about 4 guitars That bit goes into more what would be deemed as classic rock, I suppose, because it's slightly more kind of melodic and slightly less uh, quirky than the bit before that. Um, going on through this, um, we got some quite nice guitar. Um, it's hard to describe what this is like. I mean, occasionally I like to throw in a couple of uh, things that are a bit left of center I mean we did it on we talked on believe which is it's actually got a country and western feel to it and this has got um, it's the same kind of thing it's like banjo picking do a little 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 but in context of this kind of music obviously it sounds nothing like that and uh, <laughs> it wouldn't be like to admit that it did <laughs> Um, yeah, recording the bass for Pure um, is the second album now that uh, I've done where we've basically done all of our parts in our own home. So Clive's done his keyboards at home, Nick's done his stuff at his house, and I've done the bass at my house. Um, and uh, so that makes you more relaxed, gives you more time, although deadlines were tight <laughs> as normal, but it uh, gives you lots more options you can record a lot of tracks side by side uh, whereas in the old days with old analog two inch tape you used to just get your allotted track or tracks a couple of tracks and that would be it and you'd get your two or three days to record and that would be it you'd have to do the whole album uh, and any retakes during that time and that would be it and then it'd be mixed and, and be out because it was so expensive <laughs> the GT5 straight into the Fender with absolutely no delay on it whatsoever because um, uh, with a sound like this it's much better if you could uh, use the studio delay that Carl's got you can put a really expensive sounding delay on it and so I really wanted the bare bones of the sound but the great thing about this is that you can really get the squelches I do beg your pardon, that is not the Gibson Les Paul, that's the Fender Strat Plus Deluxe with EMG pickups. And the laser eyes, man! Wah, wah, wah. Well, at 1.30 everything was going okay, it's now 1.40 and I am fed up. So maybe at this point we should have some lunch. I ain't music. Where is 
fed up. Yeah. Why can't some gorgeous girl send me a text? <laughs> Cheer me up. It's pathetic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, uh, when you're writing, a fear comes over you that you know you you may be becoming boring, and you always want to keep things interesting. Um, you don't want a section to go on for too long, but you also want it to build up as well. With this album, I've really been very aware of that, and also tried to go for a sort of few shock tactics as well. So you've got something which is buzzing along, and then completely change it into a different kind of feel which is what I did on the end section of Comatose 1. Whereas I use these flutes which are like um, old Mellotron type of flutes. And there's old cello samples in there as well and guitar samples as well. Normally with guitars, you know, you just usually record them, but occasionally you come across a sample that you think that's really going to take it in a different direction. I would never uh, normally use that sound as a guitar, but as a sample, it's very usable. And so I use that on this part as well. It's just a very original kind of sound. There's a whole load of stuff going on there. But the whole feel of this is um, it's just all samples. You've got cellos. Um, I think you've got some Kurt strings in there. But it kind of has a shock aspect because you're just not expecting um, something like that to come out of something which is so heavy and so driving. Um, you know, suddenly you've got this sort of um, Mellotron flutes and what have you, and then suddenly you've got this kind of. Um, uh, violin solo as well, so it's kind of juxtaposes a lot of different feels there. Got to be done though. Uh, the keyboard setup over the years has changed immensely. When I first joined, there was a lot of borrowed stuff. There was a Poly 6, I seem to remember, and some kind of a mono keyboard, and I can't really remember. And then we went through the stage where more was more, and uh, I used to have quite a lot of keyboards. I, I a pen dragon, I can't remember, but I probably had one, two, three, four, five, maybe six keyboards. Now, um, thanks to the technical um, improvements in keyboards themselves, I've got it down to three. And I have uh, actually three tritons, which is uh, two exactly like this one here, which is like a synth feel. And then there's another one, which is like a weighted keys. Uh, version, not that, but a Triton again. So I've got three, and they're very powerful keyboards. They have a lot of sounds, and I can play, I can um, input samples into them, so, you know, the kind of funny sound effects and things that pop out occasionally on the albums, I can reproduce those live as well. So I'm very happy with that setup. And three keyboards is about right for Pendragon. You're constantly changing sounds, but they're, they're big keyboards, so I can kind of put zones, like a bit of strings here, and a piano there, and a, a lead there, so it works. Okay, hey, um, yeah, 30 years of Pendragon, wow, <laughs> feels like a lifetime, uh, feels like a different lifetime ago. Um, we were all young, naive, in our, well, I think I was 18 actually when I joined Pendragon, uh, fresh out of, the, <laughs> coming out of school, and uh, yeah, the early days were, uh, we had that youthful excitement and vitality to carry us through, so... In, in those days we would play anywhere, for anyone, for any fee, or a, any amount of loss of money. We would drive, for example, 
um, 200 miles across the country to play in a tiny little pub in Norwich when, and come back home more than happy to have lost 50 or 100 pounds. The new posters have arrived. <laughs> this is when it starts getting really exciting. This is just great. All right, let's have a look. Oh no! They've been damaged on the way. Not really. Here they are. Here. Yeah. Look at this. Oh, fantastic! It's got all the tour dates on it. Really nice quality paper. And they smell right as well. Look at that! Fantastic! Your posters, they've arrived! Track 5 is called The Freak Show. And it's about something that everyone, I think, can relate to. And it's that intense insecurity that you feel um, you know, when you come into adolescence and childhood you've just got a kind of a crazy way of being and your only real problem is you know where your next bag of sweets is going to come from. Um, <laughs> when you get older you start worrying about spots and money and the problems of having to actually deal with life to kind of just come crashing down and the insecurity that goes with that. I mean I can remember going through um, walking through my hometown think you just feel that everybody is staring at you and you just feel so insecure and hence the lyrics don't want people to see the freak show going on inside me and the other part is where um, you know you have the freedom of being on the beach and just the happy-go-lucky sort of lifestyle that the lyrics reflect of someone you know, just throwing stones into the sea um, and how music, I mean this is all kind of part of my life and how I felt. The first lyrics are um, flicking through my Bowie LPs, uh, Ziggy Saved My Life, because that Ziggy Stardust album for me was a hugely important record. Uh, it's one that really catapulted me into uh, pop music in, in a big way and rock music. And um, I think a lot of people when they're that age they use music as a real crutch and it can really, really help them through to find something, you know, where musicians can relate to how they feel. So stuff like that. The second part was um, about my California wife. I always felt that I'd marry an American woman, probably from Baywatch or something like that. And um, so that was part of the imagery that I thought, you know, when I was younger would become reality. Um, so there you go. That's the freak show. The Freak Show was a little bit of a wake-up call, really, Qu quite literally. It is quite literally an alarm clock. The idea um, here was, oh, this started off as a riff, a uh, guitar riff, um, you know, which, again, is quite a different kind of approach for Pendragon because it sounds really quite heavy. Um, and that's been married up with a very melodic guitar uh, melody as well. And technically, you know, you'd think those two couldn't really be glued together, but here it just works so, so well. Um, and I liked it because, again, this is new for us. It's a lot of energy. Here you've got five guitars all bursting to be heard. Two very contradictory kind of parts there, but then you know he goes back into the heavy bit. As well. And another completely different feel that I mean there's a lot of feels in this song um, you know it's kind of been pulled in so many directions but it works so well I think um, is uh, you know when it goes into the vocal part it's got that sort of 50s 
um, tremolo here. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, sort of uh, very clean sounds like the vibes, like the clean sound of the fender to a reverb again. Give it a tremolo and like that sound. I'm too weak, also. But I feel like Mr. Burns. Get the grub on then. I've had an exhausting day. Rehearsal up in Haywards Heath last night, coming back, half one in the morning, go to bed, get up touring at half seven, go and get Max from Winchester, drive back, have a day on the motocross track, come back, drive down to Devon. So, not feeling that funny. Give us a beer, that beer's a bit brown, isn't it? It's brown, eh, you it? The last song on the album is called It's Only Me, um, as it relates to just the power of the individual um, as, as children. Um, it occurred to me how some kids in some countries, uh, you know, have barely got anything to eat, um, and yet they've all got, always got a big smile on their face. I mean, you look at some of these documentaries of kids in Africa, they come running up, a big grin on their face, and, you know, they, they don't have um, what in the Western world that we would call a rich lifestyle, but they have a kind of a, a, a balance that um, a lot of kids now in the Western world don't have. And there's a terrific value in that, that, you know, we kind of quite, can't quite see, you know, a, a, um, a resourcefulness and a resilience to trouble. And also, uh, uh, having read this book, The Whisperers, about uh, you know, communist Russia, um, there were kids, you know, who went through just immensely difficult times, uh, and this song was inspired from that kind of feeling. Um, it's a conversation with a child, and um, how they are able to, how as when we become adults, you know, we look back and you wish that we had that kind of innocence and that ability to shrug things off and that kind of resilience, because really, as you get older. The more you know, the less you know, and the less you are able to to fight them all. While they hurled abuse and pathetic little stones, always in my childish mind exists the sad world. So it's very good, which is drive over. Yeah. I think the truth is a separate part at the beginning anyway. Yeah. And we even drive the rest of the train. So we're a bit more delayed. We're trying to create, create kind of a kind of more incident feel for that. Yeah, brilliant. So that's quite good with some delay on that. Yeah. And then back to it being dry. And of brothers. We are the spark. Um, it's only me, guitar solo, again Gibson Les Paul, GT5, Fender Twin Reverb, mic up. You can't go wrong with the sound, I mean it's just lovely, it's got... Th this sound works very well at low volume, um, so to record it's really nice. 
Uh, for live, I haven't quite nailed it yet because when you turn the volume up with the amp, uh, you start losing all the harmonics, which is a hell of a shame because it really is a nice sound, but uh, for recording at low volume, it's great. This week we've got porridge. Porridge gate. Porridge gate. <laughs> really? Yeah, the trouble is, it's the, other hours. End, it's the other end of the day that's the problem. It is a big problem, that is the problem because you're, you you're, you're, supposed, yeah, you're supposed to have your dinner like before 8 o'clock or so, so you have it at like 7 o'clock, and then because what happens when it gets to about 9 o'clock and you're poking around in the kitchen? I looking heard for it those, in the Barrett household. Cold roast potatoes. <laughs> I heard it in the Barrett household there was kind of jam roly poly. Get this! <laughs> well, get this on tape, go on, go on, say again. Available about midnight or something, you can well, get jam roly poly and custard at your house. See, there he goes. There he, you know, he's just saying, I heard at the Barrett household, Jam Rod, well, absolute it. tosh. Yes. Yeah. It's not though, is it? <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> Yeah, but you sometimes good, sometimes you need sustenance at that stage in the mm. evening if you're working late. It's not well, true. What about if you've been sitting in front of the telly? Well, then you might. <laughs> there you go. You there might, you go. You there still really. might need some sustenance. <laughs> yeah. You know, see, he knows that I'm trying to think of something to retaliate with now, but you I, can't, will, yeah. I can't think of anything because. Lunchtime, he's had a whacking great sausage <laughs> casserole. But typical Carl Groot, he's washed the, the Tupperware pot up so we can't actually film it. It's tied it away. There's no evidence. So look. There. See, yeah, there, 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 there. <laughs> See, yeah, this is it. You've got to be. He's, he's trying to take the wind out of my sails by saying, if you want to see the Tupperware pot, there it is over there. But it'll be a smaller one because the real one. It's that big and it's in the kitchen, I tell you. And look, look at the Barrett rations, a little bit of bird seed. <laughs> Definitely the right kind of thing. Yeah. You did sort of analog delay type thing to go with it. Right? Yeah. Vocals the moment putting some really weird effects on them. It's great fun than this, it's much more creative and tidy than that. Bass notes or every day the alarm bell rings and a face, another murder of a day. I look out of my window. The sky is deathly grey. Oh, they got that old fashioned sort of atmosphere. Way. That's brilliant. Yeah. It's going to create sort of a, a different tone. Yeah, yeah section. Brilliant. Right. Do you want to do this uh, rehearsal? Mm. Never. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 30 years. This is our 30th anniversary. Um, you know, it's quite staggering, really, that we've been going for 30 years. Um, you know, we've been through many kind of ups and downs on the way. Um, it's a bit like a marriage, really, but without the sex. <laughs> and it's you know, one of those things that, you know, when it's when it when it's bad, it's a real pain in the neck. You know, getting things sorted out and uh, you know problems that there are sort of surrounded being in a band. But when it goes right, it's just the best thing in the world. It's incredible. So you know, it's been a roller coaster. It's been a roller coaster of ups and downs. Thirty years, I'm knackered. I feel like a rest. Thirty years, and I want a holiday. I'm going on me holidays. 
you like Demi's free sauce, Ange? Do you like Demi's free sauce? That's it, that's your lot, that's the whole lot. I'm off to do a bit of motocross for the weekend. Hello, uh, this is the uh, the epicentre of Pendragon HQ, um, this is where it all happens. <laughs> I actually write an awful lot of lyrics in bed because I can't be asked to get up and um, you know, first thing in the morning, I actually, uh, you know, when, when I actually wake up about um, 12 o'clock, um, midday, um, I've got one of these things here, which is a Boss Micro BR, which I've recorded all the ideas for the album on. It's a four track machine, it's got a stereo pair, which leaves you two tracks for adding uh, vocals and other ideas. It's brilliant, it's got a little built-in microphone, you can just sit here with these headphones on, listening to the music and getting ideas for song melodies and for lyrics. I also write everything down in this book for... I just scribble, I just scribble, scribble, scribble. I mean, there's stuff in here, and I have to do it with a pencil, because when you're lying in bed, you're like that, the pen runs out. And it's a real inspiration killer. You have to be really lazy and just scribble, like that. And then the ideas seem to come. I mean, some of these ideas, I've just written things down here that I either thought were good song titles or ideas. And I'd be interested to see if any of these actually sort of turn up on the album. I've just put a title down here, just called Future Perfect, you know, because I thought that'd be a good title. And what's this? Wasting My Time... Oh, crap, no, forget that. I'm just trying to find something that... I mean, this is all just absolute scribble down. And these give ideas to other ideas which then sort of pave the way as far as I'm concerned for um, you know becoming songs because it's almost like you've got to get some of the crud out of your system first before you get, you start writing the real stuff. I mean I started on comatose the other day and I just couldn't get the feel that I wanted to do and then just started scribbling and then it just came out and uh, these lyrics go it said that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world the rusty key unlocks the door to let the child go. Where is the boy who used to write his name in the sand? Where is the boy who used to sing? And then I'll run out of puff. And so I won't have anything there um, for a few days. I just ran out, stopped, and just had, ran out of inspiration. You know, because, but I really liked that first part of it. So that'll probably be, end up being the first part of Comatose. Now sod off out of my bedroom. <sighs> Oh, hello. Um, welcome to the latest installment of Studio Spy. Um, I'm just reading um, OK Magazine to find out what's happening in the world of celebs and showbiz. Um, I wasn't licking that page uh, at all. Um, this picture of my two favourite girls, Noemi Lenoir and Miling class. Um, I was just nodding in appreciation. Um, it's absolutely peeing down outside. There's a beautiful waving. I've been out there for a couple of hours. Oh, flipping fantastic. I feel spiritually completely regenerated. And now I want a pasta. A bloody great pasta. That was fantastic. Really good, really nice. Brilliant wave out there. It's Peter. It's this gig diary, is it? Just hope my Devon page is still in, otherwise we're over. <laughs> oh, it's the easy. Creek. It's easy. Is it? Yeah.
bad news on the road. <laughs> um, Is it north, north Devon? North Devon, yeah. This is what it's all about, rock and roll. Devon, we're going to rock Devon tonight. <laughs> Who's driving the van today? You are, you are okay. Just remember, it's Friday the 13th today, and although generally I find that to be a lucky day, uh, you ought to remember that actually statistically there are more car crashes on Friday the 13th. So well, it's a good drive job carefully, It's kids. a good job we're travelling in a van then. <laughs> and van crashes, I think, is the. Oh, so you're, to, you're faced the other way there. Normally it comes out. You're facing, they're facing out to sea. Right, first thing to do is stop the van. Um, as you are listening to this, we have just finished the drums. Uh, it's Tuesday today. We finished the drums last Friday. Uh, it's really sounding fantastic, and I think the whole album's going to be really, really good. It's now. 24th of June. Uh, by the end of June, we've got to finish all the vocals. I finished some of the guitars yesterday for the freak show. Bass is really coming along now. I went over to Peter's last night and heard some of that, what he's done there. Some really nice bass guitar playing. And so, by the end of June, we'll have everything recorded and then hopefully we can start mixing it all up. Look, yeah, beautiful. I get the crosser out this weekend go for a bit of a burn. That's Rob. That's that's Rob Aubrey in the corner. We does our sound. He only comes to annoy us, really. We really. Well, I hate... don't just come to annoy you. I come to take your money as well. Not much. Yeah, he does. He takes. He takes. He takes my money. Um, it all goes into. It's a bit early for the funnel of cash. Yeah. Prog is. We hate Rob. <laughs> we have to. It's the only way. Nice. There's a kind of a love hate. We love to hear. And do things like come up behind him at the mixing desk with a, a shaver, no, and take a bit off the back of his hair. We did that in Warsaw, and he didn't even flinch. <laughs> just carried on. <laughs> his hair went bloop. He just kind of just went. Hmm. Can you be there? What is this? So no. And he just comes to Don Tor to annoy. I, he's, he's, he's a child. This is why we're like two children in kindergarten that want the same football. And I always get the football. So what he does, he lets me have the football. And he, he does something really horrible when he gets the opportunity to get me back. Look at him, look. Hey Nick, look. I think we should do a promo photo like that. <laughs> That's <laughs> really <right>. good. <laughs> mm. I'm surprised he hasn't tried to nick my breakfast. Mind you, he's probably eat for about five. He usually does. He eats and eats and eats. Rising too much. Look 
kill that fucking cake boy. Get off! Whip! 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 The Aubrey must die. <laughs> See, you're not even safe for breakfast. <laughs> Did I start it? <laughs> Let's face it. <laughs> I want bread and butter pudding. He's got bread and butter pudding. I want bread and butter pudding as well. I don't want fruit. No one wants fruit. Oh. Let's be honest. There's fruit in it. <laughs> <laughs> He, he's just trying to twist the knife. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, 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 one of the nicest guys in the world, but subtly, he's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> he's ever so subtle. You don't even know it's happening to you. <laughs> Till it's too late. <laughs> oh, crikey. I oh, think yesterday was the best. It was like... A bit bored now, I've got something else I'm going to do, and it went here. Well, how does that sound to you, Carl? Yeah. In other words, I'm not getting involved. In your argument. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know. So Nick, one of the nastiest guys in the world, but subtly nice. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's, that's, that's sort of true in a I'm not nasty though. Who's that silence? I'm sport? not. <laughs> He's all no. bark and no bite. I'm going home with him. Right, perhaps I should take my album to a band where I might be appreciated a little more. Well, you've been to see the Osmonds recently, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> So this, this is it. This is what I'm talking about. He's been thinking of that for the last five minutes. He's just kind of like going along, going along. There it is. There it is. <laughs> so he's laughing because he knows he's doing it. All right, I've been had. Right. And while we're at it, Scotty. Don't bring me into it. I'm going to bring you into it, you and Bross. What have you got to say? Whoa, hold on a Ooh. second. Ooh. Oh yeah, he could have fit into Bros. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the right vest on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's nothing he can say about that. Speechless. He's stuck. That's bad in the world. They were. I thought they were fantastic. He's going the other way. He's trying to justify yeah, it. That was good. That was good. Carl's turning. Bring him back. Bring him back. Get Carl. You we can wait. Well, what have I? What have we got here? Hold me off for eating a piece of bread pudding. I didn't tell you off, bro. I you just said it's that bread. You didn't have any. I just said it's that bread pudding. We'll get him back. You know how we'll get him back? We'll simply make an album at his place. That's, <laughs> it. That's enough. <laughs> We're just having one or two really crap studio japes because it's really funny for the documentary when everyone starts acting far more than they would normally. Especially Carl. As soon as, the key, as soon as he knows the camera on, camera's on, he just becomes completely animated. <laughs> See? He's trying to bait me again.